You're listening to Managing Leadership Anxiety, Yours and Theirs, a podcast offered in partnership with Missio Alliance. Each episode, we discuss internal and relational pressures, how they block effective leadership, and how we can move through them to a greater health. And now your host, Steve Cuss. Friends, I have been a great beneficiary of Dr. Scott McKnight's writings and blog for years. And one of my favorite things about his blog is how he introduces us to so many incredible thinkers, particularly theologians. And today I have the great honor of hosting Dr. Lucy Pepiat uh, on my podcast. Uh, Lucy's the principal of Westminster Theological Center right there in London in England. Uh, But also she has written extensively on Paul and women. You know those pesky passages, particularly 1 Corinthians 11, where it's difficult to make sense of. It feels like maybe Paul's disagreeing with himself, or what's he saying? Does he really want women to wear veils, and who should get a haircut? All that kind of stuff. Well, among many other things, uh, Dr. Pepia has written extensively on that. Now, hey, not to tease you, we're not diving into that, that today. What I'm interested in is Lucy as a principal of a training school for young theologians and young pastors, because her husband's a pastor. Anglican trained, and uh, one of the things that Lucy did when she came into leading a theological center was to look at, okay, how are we doing it, what needs to change, and also the nature of power. And as my listeners know, this has been our topic this whole season, is how power works, how power relates to anxiety. So Lucy, welcome to the Managing Leadership Anxiety Podcast. Thanks, Steve. It's great to be here. I'm always interested in people who wear more than one hat. You had this academic hat, but you also had this leadership hat. I wonder if you would just tell us about your leadership hat. What is it that you do as a leader? Yeah, I, as a leader, I lead a college, um, as you said. So we have a theological college called Westminster Theological Center, WTC, we call it now for ease. (laughs) And it's a dispersed model with a hub model all around the UK. And I have been in leading the college since 2012. I was appointed principal in 2013. Um, And I've also been involved in church leadership, initially with my husband, as you do, you know, when you're married. Um, And then in later years, also a bit more on my own as he's kind of stepped back. And I, I really enjoy leading in church, preaching, teaching, Uh, but I love leading at the college and I consider it a huge privilege to be able to um, take an institution and to shape it because when I when I took over it was in uh, uh, all sorts of crises really and um, gave me the opportunity to kind of start afresh a little bit with an already brilliant idea but something that hadn't been hadn't been fully formed Yeah, and that's often what gets a leader into leadership or sometimes also into trouble is we we see what's wrong and we have a vision for what something can be. And then, of course, we get leadership uh, shoulders under it and we realize, man, this is going to take longer or it can Mm -hmm. be more complex. What are some of the challenges that you inherited when you first showed up as principal? What were maybe just two or three dynamics that you looked at and said, oh, I really think this needs to change? Mm-hmm. You're so right on the thing of it taking way longer than yeah. you hope. You know, I think I, I looked at the sort of the foundations of what WTC was at the time, which was a, a very exciting uh, college that had my predecessor had had a vision to combine academic theology and the charismatic spirituality that I'm from, that's part of of my church world and life. And he had done that very well. And and I'd seen, I was teaching a little bit at WTC at the time when he resigned. Um, So I knew that this was unique and I thought, this is fantastic. It's such a vibrant place. There's um, the classrooms are just full of interesting conversation. It was all part time. So people were working and studying at the same time and came from all walks of life, ages, professions, um, etc. So it wasn't just for training church leaders at all, by any means. 
and so I saw all of that was good, but the um, the the stru well, it just needed sort of shaping, I think, and and leading with some with some really good values embedded. And I had seen, I was interested in your emphasis on anxiety because I had seen that the uh, under the sort of old regime, the ha anxiety had kind of distorted the the college to uh, to become something that i didn't think it should be you know there'd been anxiety over money lot always there's always anxiety lots of anxiety over money yeah. um anxiety over um well there's a competition isn't there so if you set up a college here and then there's a college there and then people compete as if there's a sort of pie that we all need to break up and cut up and if i have a piece you can't have a piece um so the the sort of insecurity um money fears competitive values all those sort of things i thought actually it'd be really good and, and also a lack of transparency about certain things so some people knew things that other people were didn't know and you know and I thought do you know what if if I'm going to lead something I don't want all of that I I would I I think that just ties everybody up in knots and I I wanted the chance to see if it would be possible for to to create a culture where we could resist all those things and put other things in their place and so that's what I have tried to do in the last 10 years yeah okay so you've been there 10 years mm. and of course when you come in with a, a values driven leadership it's a often a gentler and a slower process and obviously you never quite get there right like you're always trying to move toward it um at what point in your leadership did you wake up and say oh man this is going to take longer than i thought <laughs> i yeah, I think every year I do that. Every year, <laughs> every year in the, so uh, you know, obviously, college you go through recruitment, the recruitment cycle, don't you? And so, um, so you learn something, and then it takes you a whole year to be able to implement the next, the next thing. And so every every September, as we launch off, and we count all our numbers, and we count up all our money, and we count up all, uh, every year. I go, oh wow, this is going to take longer than I thought, you know. And um, and so we always have encouragements every year. But um, I had, I think, when I took over, I'd sort of hoped that we would just mushroom, you know, into being this, uh, having the numbers and the hubs that we needed to break even. That was the dream, you know. That's the dream for every college, isn't it? And um, yeah, so every year I check myself again and say, remember. And in fact, I put that on my, my last appraisal. Um, somebody said, uh, my, my, the trustee who was running it said, what, what's your big learning point from this year, Lucy? And I said, it takes way longer than I want it to. Yeah. It, it's interesting to hear you talk about it. I, I, I was a lead pastor at a church for 16 years and I still attend that church. I'm still on staff at it, but I handed leadership over and to be on the other, listening to you coming in and setting all the values up. I, I was caught off guard when I handed over how much regret I held and had to deal with that. I thought I would have led us further along by now. Um, came in very idealistic and so excited and probably too many ideas, but really passionate about what a local church could be. And many of them we did, you know, 16 years in, many of them. But but so many of them, I as I handed over thinking, oh man, I, I just assumed if I, when I started that 16 years later, we would be so much further along. It's really, mm -hmm. it's quite humbling, isn't it? Um, when you were the primary leader to, to see how much energy it takes and um, Absolutely. Yeah. What's yeah. your response to that? Um, I my response to that is I think that one's team is so important, um, mm. and I I've really learned that. And I've seen well because I've been in church leadership and now in the running what is effectively a business really, but but mm -hmm. it's a Christian business. Um, and I I know that. T the team is essential so t because otherwise what one shoulders everything you know 
alone and and it's too much it's not it's not and it, it's not what god wants for us so the the what i what i realized uh, and i realized very early on and is the amount of energy that one needs to bring to a to a venture you know um whether that's the church or or your organization or your business if you're the one in charge the the level of energy lies with you and um i saw that very starkly with covid and when we were doing everything online because to, you know as you know and we all know now bringing that kind of energy into a over zoom requires a lot more than bringing it into a room where you've got interaction and banter and jokes and so um that was particularly taxing and and in that those situations knowing that my team was in the background and or in the foreground with me uh was enormously important and the kind of we we had you know you use whatsapp presumably do you use whatsapp mm -hmm. yeah Mostly because of my English friends, okay. you guys have made me. Okay, yeah. yeah. So we we're on WhatsApp all the time, and yeah. we have a staff WhatsApp, and the 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 that was how we constantly communicated over the lockdowns, and it, it's littered with hilarious jokes, you know, and gifts and all sorts of things. So the so I found a lot of my energy was being fed into me via my team, which was just essential and and i would say and and the hard you know as you know the hardest aspects of leadership is when the team something's happened on your team and you have to step in you have to intervene or you have to handle something that um is very stressful for you you know you might have to confront someone you might have to do a performance thing you might have to deal with um something and and that's extremely stressful your husband was trained to be clergy what, over three decades ago, and here you are uh, leading a clergy training center. Um, what are one or two of the top anxieties you're seeing in your students? And then I wonder if you would share a couple of anxieties you're seeing in young pastors nowadays. Yeah, so we, we actually don't train. Um, th th we're not Anglican. So um, my husband is an Anglican and was trained at Wycliffe Hall in Oxford. And my college is non-denominational. And we actually mostly, most of our students are not in church leadership. But we do, uh, we do train people from independent charismatic networks and churches. And we are their equivalent of kind of an ordination type training. So it's just a slightly different mix in the classroom. Well, a very different mix really from the kind of clergy training that um, that my husband was in. Uh, so we have, but, but most of us, I mean, the majority of our students are Christians and are embedded in their church. And so the conversation is often around church life um, and pastoral issues. So in terms of anxiety, um, gosh, well, I mean, cost of living anxieties are just shooting through the roof right now. So that's a big deal for us. Um, and that's a big topic of conversation. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety over the conversation around gender and identity. You know, that, I mean, that's pervaded, I think, most of our Western countries and um, and it leaves many of us at a loss. And I think, you know, there's anxiety about that, that surfaces, um, not that people have lots of brilliant answers, but I think we need to sort of talk to one another and try and be um, open and compassionate. Um, so those are two anxieties. The climate is an anxiety. It was interesting. I was talking to a friend who works for a student organization over here, and they've just, they're currently doing a big survey, biggest one they've ever done. And one of their questions is, how do you think the world, how do you think the world is going to end? Um, and rather than nuclear war, uh, which one, you know, maybe if, a while ago people might have said that and um, they said the climate change so 
that's clearly on young people's minds a lot. It's two fascinating answers, Lucy. One of the tools we use in my work is we have a list of the 31 universal anxiety generators. And it's a simple PDF. You can go into any organization and look for them. Mm. And uh, one of them is when you are supposed to have an answer and you do not. Mm. So that first topic you mentioned, gender identity, for many leaders, it feels like there's a topic that kind of came out of nowhere and suddenly became number one, Mm -hmm. you know, shot to the top of the charts, Mm -hmm. if you will. And most people were not equipped. We're still trying to get your mind around the scope of the question, but human beings are involved and lots of pain involved. And and then that second one, another anxiety, you know, would be where it's difficult to see the difference you individually are making in climate change being this massive Mm -hmm. problem. Um, It's fascinating that that's two of the anxiety generators. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And the, and very much, I suppose, with younger people, it's it's big, but it's hitting every every generation, I would say. So, um, yeah, I think those probably be the top ones I would notice. It seems like also uh, because I, I kind of think it's because of social media, but it's like there are forty things that are generating outrage and require immediate attention, and the human can only manage a handful, and so we're constantly trying to navigate which of these genuine systemic problems do we have the capacity to tackle and most of these problems are long term but maybe due to social media we feel an urgency um that seems to be another one no too. i think that's right and then also of course the um loneliness i mean i think that's a huge issue here i don't know about other countries perhaps but isolation and loneliness are massive social issues here and um Obviously, the church is equipped to be able to address those, but I'm not sure we've sort of fathomed the extent of it yet or or really worked out what we do for for single people who are apparently of uh, one of my cousins who's been widowed, was widowed when she was quite young. She was saying that 50% of our population are, are single. And that's huge. And then, but churches often you know pay more attention to the married people as we know and the people with children and you know and i think we've got to we've got to shift the balance there somehow yeah lucy when you came into wtc one of the one of the things you said that struck me was how you wanted to bring a values based leadership and uh it is fascinating that having clear values is a way to lower the anxiety in the system or in any group of people would you give us one or two of the values that were cultivated early and then how do you measure how they're doing that's that that's can be more nebulous that's tricky oh yeah uh, totally so um we have five main ones which are creativity humor efficiency mm-hmm led by the spirit and transparency um and we so so we do try and measure them uh, and then we have ways we've written all this down and we have ways of explaining how we see them they might be lived out um and then we have we have other more detailed values written down about how we want to manage, for instance. So we have managers' values um, and team values and behavioral values. Um, We had a a great session with a friend of ours who, that there's a church in Bracknell called Kerith Church and they they are a values-shaped church. And so our friend, Ben Oliver came and talked us through how they run their values from and hire. Well, and we had always done so you you recruit your values um, and that goes all the way down, you know, from the trustees to the staff team to the, all the people in the organization. And then I think just getting feedback, feedback from students is important because if they can't see those values, you know, if they're not evident, then you haven't yeah. done it. Um, yeah. They're just aspirations. Uh, so uh, we like to get feedback from people who come in from the outside to see whether they can actually see that working between us. Um, yeah, uh, it's been a great, I, I, I love, it's challenging, um, but it's it's a wonderful 
releasing way really of leading because you don't it doesn't all lie with you as the leader you've you've created some kind of external um system that in one sense everyone's accountable to including me you know and if i if i don't lead to the values then i can be pulled up by the people i'm leading and it gives mm -hmm. them a it gives them a framework and a narrative to challenge me whereas i think that it's very difficult to challenge a boss um, and uh, you know, how does, how does one do it unless they actively open the door to that? And, and I think that makes a way without me having to, to um, orchestrate it as it were. Yeah. One, I, I was lit up when you said one of your values is humor. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think some of us would say the British may be the best at humor in the world, even, <laughs> Even as an Aussie, I have to confess. That's very big. Um, <laughs> yes, e even though your ancestors sent mine uh, to Australia for mule thievery, I, 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 I used to, yeah, I used to believe my ancestor was a horse thief, and uh, all my life I've I've been told that. And then in 2019, my aunt, who kind of manages our family history, she said actually John Warby was a mule thief, not a horse thief. Oh. And, I've lost all respect for him now. I'm like, that's ridiculous, but, but I digress. But you mentioned humor being one of the values in, in systems theory. Um, playfulness is actually one of the evidences that a system is relaxed mm, mm. and earnestness or too much earnestness is evidence that a, a group is anxious. I'd love to hear more about humor uh, because I, I do think it's a, a tool available to most leaders that they, they don't use enough. Uh, how do you utilize humor and then how do you measure uh, the effect of, of humor? Yeah, I, uh, we, in my own family, the, the Pepiot family, so this is my maiden name, um, my father and his cousins and his own father, they had, a, they had a, a long story which they used to tell, which culminated in, in this idea that there was a rule number four and what was the rule four? And rule four was never take yourself too seriously. So that was a kind of family motto that I was brought up with, um, that you should never take yourself too seriously. And my, I saw my father kind of living that out and sewing that into our family. And so there was always lots of laughs as I was growing up as well as quite sort of deep and, you know, honest conversations. But, and I, I always appreciated that. And I, I watched him diffuse situations with humor that was never unkind, never, it was never at anyone's expense. It was often at his expense. I mean, he would play the fool in some way. And, and, um, and it was, it was such a gift. And I, I thought that's brilliant because nothing, nothing's that serious, actually. It, it re and I don't mean that flippantly. Um, but because of course there are terribly serious things. But one of the things that I think the British do quite well is, is also laughing in pain or, or, you know, um, and and just having that freedom to say it's okay to laugh even when something is absolutely terrible um and so i so yes i think it's an advantage to be british in that, in that sense because we don't worry we don't we don't have an anxiety about laughing in dreadful situations we do that and we all kind of give permission to each other to do that um, and then it was just something I had seen in my own family. And and so the team, I have some very funny people on my team. I mean, they make me laugh so much. And and they know, they're very good. They know how to bring it. You know, it's not inappropriate. They, and, and if someone is in pain and needs, and we need to not laugh, that's also people are sensitive about that. So, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm delighted with the people around me because I think they orchestrate that very well mm. yeah i i think the gift of british humor to be specific is the gift of absurdity yeah uh, when, when if i had to put one word on it because what we're talking about here is actually really important like mockery is never if mockery and sarcasm i mean that sarcasm that has a knife to it yeah. that's always the evidence that's that anxiety is at play but absurdity is really uh, i think the unique british gift mm. and slapstick yeah. I think, you know, we're yeah, very good at that. 
definitely playfulness yes yeah. playfulness and and actually it, i love that you talk about playfulness because one of the things i say to the college when people to the first years is please be playful as you do theology you know it's not this it is of course it's a serious pursuit we're talking about god and you know and and our christian lives but i don't want them to be anxious about right and wrong you know i want them to be able to think and question and play so i say you know be playful because if you if you can't be playful you won't develop your ideas because you'll always be anxious that someone's looking over your shoulder telling you you're wrong um and that's not a good way to learn isn't it uh, G.K. Chesterton, I think, talks about that, where um, I'm, I'm pulling the quote from the back of my brain, but, but he says, our sin has made us grow old, mm. and God enjoys monotonous play. Mm. The way a child, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the quote, but the way a child loves you to pick them up and throw them in the air, and then when you put them down, they say, do it again. Mm and your arms wear out before their interest wears out. So they want you to keep throwing them in the air again and again. And Chesterton goes on to say that could it be that our father every morning says to the son, do it again, and to every daisy he handcrafts, and that our sin has made us old and weary and our father is younger than we are. <laughs> one of my favorite, yeah, one of my favorite Chesterton quotes. Yeah. Well, Lucy, you've been a great sport as we've talked about leadership and humor and theology, but tragically for all of us, it is time for you to endure <laughs> the gauntlet of anxiety questions. So we've just got three or four for you. Um, let's see how they do. And, and these may resonate and these may not. So it's totally fine to hear one and say, oh, I don't know what I think about that. Here's the first one is a chronic anxiety. It actually resides in false belief. That's where it starts but it's easiest to detect in our body. And so how do you know you're anxious? Your three options would be whether you have a racing mind, like that kind of person would worry their way to peace, for example, or try to, or a racing heart, or a tightening body, like clenched shoulders or a, or a gut. Which would it be for you, a spinning mind, a racing heart, or a tightening body? It would be, I would say, Actually, for me, I would say I get very irritable when I'm anxious. Okay. So it would be because um, my I think my mind races kind of normally. That's my normal sort of position. Okay. Um, my heart, I've had, that's just different because I had long COVID and actually my heart was often racing, which was a physiological thing, which so... And it, so I, I lost track of whether I was, my heart was because mm. of something I ate or something I did rather than yeah. anxious. So, yeah. So now I know I'm more, I get very, um, yeah, just sort of irritable and, and irascible. And then I think I'm anxious. What am I anxious about? I, I feel like biting someone's head off. I know I'm anxious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And then typically anxiety kind of tricks us in the moment of thinking that this is a unique situation. But if you step back, you do start to see patterns in yourself. So would there be a typical situation that you know, oh, yeah, this is the kind of situation that's going to make me anxious or generate anxiety? So for me, a guarantee would be a critical email from a congregant. I just know mm. if I get a critical email because I'm a chronic people pleaser, yeah, it's going to generate anxiety. Would there be a case for you? Um, I think that it would be, I have children, they're grown up now. Um, and they, so I think if I thought they were contacting me to tell me something had gone terribly wrong, um, that would, you know, and they've had issues in their lives, things that they've dealt with, which have been hard to watch and live with them and so if if there was a message that i thought there was something had gone wrong that would trigger some anxiety yeah okay good a another work we do in systems theory is we look at generational patterns in our family sometimes we go back to great grandparents and we look for what what has been handed down and so just in a very simple way would there be one trait that you've inherited that's a real asset in your leadership 
And then is there a trait that's a liability in your leadership? I would say that the trait, I think I was talking about my dad and his ability to see the funny side. Um, I think I inherited that and and I that, that helps me and I think sometimes helps people around me um, and not taking myself too seriously, which is always a good thing. Um, the liability, um, I think, I don't know if it's inherited, but I sometimes I get impatient with, if I can see the right answer, I don't want to go through the process of talking about it. And, and can we not just do that now? So I've learned, and because I respect and trust my team, which is great, I've learned to stop, go through the process, even though I think I saw the right answer from the beginning, um, and listen, genuinely listen to the problems that there might be with what I had already thought up. Oh, what a great it's answer. Definitely a life yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's a great answer. Okay, the final question, uh, we've already covered humor, that the two biggest forces that displace chronic anxiety is, is laughter, and then the second one is love. It's very difficult to be in the grip of anxiety when you're experiencing love. So is there a time in your life where you feel most fully and completely loved? Uh, yes, I feel, I feel very loved. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a close family, both family that I grew up with, my siblings, and actually we've got closer since we, as we've got older and since my parents have died. And I'm close to my sons and now thankfully to their wives, which is lovely. And I think that th those are my very safe places with my siblings and with my children and my children-in-law. And I, I think it's because they all get me. I feel I feel like I'm just I can just be always be myself and I'm understood and appreciated for who I am so I'm not asked to be anything else. Mm. And that makes me feel very loved. My guest today was Lucy Pepiot. She's the principal of Westminster Theological Center. She's the author of many books. She is of course an academic uh, systematic theology, but particularly, at least where I first ran into her work, uh, dealing with Paul's treatment of women in 1 Corinthians. Just a couple of her books, Unveiling Paul's Women, Making Sense of 1 Corinthians 11, Rediscovering Scripture's Vision for Women, Fresh Perspective on Disputed Text. These are just two of many of Lucy's books. Of course, she writes way beyond just women in the New Testament, but if you have not uh, read her work. I highly encourage it. We'll be having links in the show notes. Lucy, thank you so much for coming on the show and just sharing your journey with Thanks us. Thanks so much. It's been great. Thank you, Steve. 